Okay. This is a courtesy announcement from the clerk that we'll be starting this meeting a few minutes late.
Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I apologize for getting us started a little bit late today. I almost said happy Monday, and I know it's not. That gives you an indication of where we are. So I want to welcome everyone to our Children's Seniors and Families Committee meeting for April 11th. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> we'll begin with the roll call, and then I'm going to ask everybody on the dais to introduce themselves. Vice Chairperson Arenas. Here. Chairperson Chavez. Here. We have a quorum. Great. And Greta, can I start with you? And then we'll go this way. Good morning, everyone. Greta Hansen, Chief Operating Officer. Good morning, everyone. Michaela Lewis, Assistant County Counsel. Good morning, everyone. Deborah Porsche Usher, Interim Director for Social Service Agency. Good morning, Ignacio Guerrero, Director for the Department of Child Support Services. Good morning, Mariel Caballero, Deputy Director, Probation. Good morning, Sarah Duffy, Chief Children's Officer. All right, so thank you all. Um, first, we're gonna go to public comment, and this is an opportunity to speak to an item that is not on the agenda, but within the purview of this committee. And we have no public comment? That's okay. correct. Thank you. I'm going to close the public comment. Now we're going to go to approving um, items that are on consent or changes to the agenda. And I'll start by saying thank you. If, um, if uh, you have anything that you want to add or take off or switch around. I, I, do, I do not, Madam Chair, so I will just move uh, consent items. All right. So what I would like to do is um, we're going to uh, make sure that on consent is our is item going to be item five. This is our extra help usage report. Item six, our family friendly workplace certificate program. And just to thank uh, the, the team that's working on that, appreciate all their good work. And with that, we have a motion, and I'll make a second for the consent calendar. Is there anybody who would like to speak to us on items that are on the consent calendar? I have no requests. Thank you, and I will close the public hearing, and we'll take a vote on consent. Vice Chairperson Arenas? Yes. Chairperson Chavez? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to move to item four. This is Title IX, and um, I'll ask if there are staff here who can give us an update on where we are with our Title IX work. And if you could just take a, a minute to give a little bit of background um, on this item. And I'm, I might start by just um, for uh, Supervisor Arenas. This is um, an initiative that was brought forward by myself and Senator Cortezzi when he was on the board. And this was what we were trying to better understand is what role the county could play in assuring that Title IX programming was occurring in our schools and colleges um, and coming at it, frankly, from a third party perspective so that we would be able to create a level playing field throughout the county in terms of the, the protection of the Title IX rights with an emphasis on um, making sure that we're protecting folks against sexual predation. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Chavez and members of the committee. Casey Halkin, Deputy County Executive, with a report out on updates relating to the comprehensive assessment of educational institutions' compliance with state and federal law regarding sex and gender-based harassment and violence and related community engagement. Today, I am joined by representatives from Cozen O'Connor. They will be joining us virtually our contractor on this project and a national leader in conducting investigations into sex and gender-based harassment and violence, as well as assisting institutions in compliance with Title IX. Cozen O'Connor is also working with affiliate Margolis Healy & Associates, a consulting firm that focuses on all aspects of campus safety, including campus and community security, supports, and engagement. After my comments, Cozen O'Connor will present more detailed information about the work we've completed thus far. For a brief overview, at the September 22nd, 2020 board meeting, the Board of Supervisors approved a referral from then Supervisor Cortezzi to prepare analysis pertaining to sex and gender-based violence by assessing policy compliance of K-12 schools and post-secondary institutions throughout Santa Clara County with Title IX, the Clary Act, and other relevant laws. Administration proposed addressing the referral using best practices that are trauma-informed and survivor-centered and to include our community input. 
Work on the project began in November 2022 upon execution of the agreement with Cozen O'Connor, and they are currently, I apologize, concurrently working on phase one and two, which is the initial fact finding and project kickoff and engagement with schools and districts. I'm also joined by Mary Hannah Weir from County Council, and the two of us will be here to answer questions after the presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters from Cozen O'Connor, and I believe that will be led um, by Leslie Gomez. Uh, thank you for that. I'd actually like to turn it over to Gina Smith as I pull up our PowerPoint. Hi, as Leslie's pulling up the PowerPoint, I just want to introduce the three members of our team here today, myself, Gina Maisto Smith, Leslie Gomez, and Maureen Holland. And thank you all for having us, recognizing that this is our first time presenting um, on this project. I wanted to share um, just a minute of background um, before we get into the update. And in sharing our background as the institutional response group, as a group of lawyers, we are sensitive to the legal side of the house leading the way. And I wanted to share very succinctly that we look at a big picture, holistic view of these issues. We are a practice dedicated to implementation, a practice dedicated to consultation, and a practice that does not do any civil litigation. So we neither sue nor defend institutions. We try to stay in the subject matter neutral space. It is informed by decades of evaluating thousands of cases of sex and gender-based harassment and violence over the course of our careers. Speaking to the next slide, our approach um, to this Title IX audit, in fact, starts as not legal at all, and we, we operate on the pillars of humility, empathy, accountability, and collaboration. Humility reflecting as we come into your county, we don't know what we don't know. While we may know a good deal about the law and a good deal about psychological impacts and patterns. We don't know what we don't know about individuals' experiences as well as your school administrators' experiences. So we will focus with humility on all stakeholders, including survivors, respondents, administrators, and attendant implementers. Empathy flipping the lens, and that is recognition recognizing those we serve. The foundation of Title IX is to keep individuals in school. So flipping the lens and focusing on the impacts of these issues. Accountability, being able fluently to embrace the tension and have the difficult conversation, integrating all the aspects of these issues. And then finally, collaboration, recognizing together we're better than the sum of our parts. The context that we approach this information with is by a unique integration of the regulatory framework, the psychological dynamics of trauma, of sex and gender-based harassment and violence as covered by Title IX and VAWA in the higher education space. And then finally, the individual culture, climate, history, resources, policies, procedures, personnel and values. So a tripartite integration of law, psychology, and culture. A handy day to think of the complexity from an institutional standpoint is on this slide. Um, not to teach, and I hope there are a couple of chuckles in the room, but this is exactly what educational institutions are facing every single time a case comes in and the considerations of all the moving parts of the disparate laws, the conflicting laws, and the attendant circumstances to all of these issues is critical. And we bring a unique, hopefully fluent, and simple, careful approach to implementation from the administrative standpoint of this. But I wanna focus on what's even more important and kick this to my colleague, Leslie Gomez, because while this may be the institutional view, I want to flip the lens and turn it over to Leslie to the informed care for the individual view. Thank you. As Gina framed, uh, our practice was intentionally designed to evaluate and think about the needs of the parties 
that an institution may be serving, whether that's a K to 12, a college or a university. And in flipping the lens that recognizes the understanding that we have to balance, evaluate, assess, understand, and make room for the various combinations and permutations of individuals who we may encounter through our processes. And so uh, being survivor centered to us reflects being trauma informed, understanding the way in which we can design policies, processes, and practices to foster increased reporting, to receive information, to encourage participation in a process, but at the same time, balance the care for a respondent with fairness and the recognition that while a respondent may not have neurobiological impacts of trauma, they certainly have other traumatic impacts and the educational institution's obligation is to balance both of those, the complainant and the respondent, whether it be a student, faculty, or staff member within the institution. If we think about the care compliance continuum, a, coin, a term we have coined to, to really walk through and understand, this is not a narrow or legal compliance framework, but it's a much broader framework that pays great attention to the duty of care that we owe to our individuals, how we provide consistent access to supportive measures, care and support that will kill the soil, if you will, to build trust and relationships to then step into a space where we have those fair processes that provide notice and a meaningful opportunity to be heard. So we look at this at a very holistic lens as Gina framed in the tripartite and integrated approach. And lastly, it's the recognition that we are necessarily looking at institutions that have been navigating not just the impacts of the pandemic over the past three years, but also very significant changes in Title IX. We expect during the course of our engagement, perhaps as early as next month, to have changes in that Title IX framework that will uh, hopefully in a very positive way, impact the way that the K to 12 schools are required to navigate and to return some discretion back to institutions. And part of our engagement includes providing back to the county and to all of the institutions within the county, K to 12 and oh, uh, post-secondary with some model policies that they can um, use as well as training materials and other documents to help ensure the work that we're doing is current. And as uh, you framed at the very beginning, uh, really understanding how we can level the playing field, knowing that you have a wide variety of institutions and not all are equally resourced or equally positioned. With that, I will turn to Maureen Holland, who is a key member of our team involved in leading this review. Thank you, Leslie. <clears throat> the work ahead of us has three distinct components. First is to comprehensively assess the institution's compliance with Title IX, and that involves looking at the infrastructure as designed, the written policies and procedures that each, each institution has, and then finally evaluating those in light of the existing legal requirements. The second component, which is extremely important, is community engagement, making outreach to and understanding the perspectives of the faculty, the staff, the students and community members, the parents, those whom we serve. And the third is thinking about how we might use our observations to, to shore up and tend to any deficiencies, gaps, or lack of resourcing in, in key areas with respect to the Title IX programs. So this slide provides an overview of the steps in the review. The first is a survey of the legal requirements. We have completed that step substantially However, um, we're still refining and thinking about audience for that step so that the document that we have can be as useful as possible to the constituents that will need it. Second is identifying the relevant educational institutions. We have completed that step. Uh, we have a list built of all of the educational institutions as well as Title IX coordinators associated with those institutions. Third is to catalog and review publicly available information, which we have begun to do and is underway. Um, lots of resources are available online that we've been calling and synthesizing as we go. Disseminating a survey to all the institutions. So we have a draft survey that we um, are still refining that we will share with Title IX coordinators and administrators at all of the county schools. And I should say at a high level, there are 760 educational institutions within the county. Um, and we can get more granular with that as needed, but each of those institutions will receive the survey to gather key metrics regarding their Title IX program as it exists now. 
And then finally, um, interviews and conversations with key implementers to understand how their campus responds or how their institution responds when there are Title IX reports that come in, what the overall structure of the response is to assess for pattern and trend, and how they interact with their community around prevention, education, and training. Community feedback is something we've thought a lot about in, in thinking about how we serve and get uh, input and in, in feedback from various audiences, recognizing as Gina framed, that there are a wide breadth of constituents here. Um, we have lots of languages being spoken in the county. We have lots of uh, folks with different levels of resourcing and different schools with different levels of resourcing and, a, and uh, structure of their institutional response to date. So thinking carefully about how we ensure that each of those communities has the ability to provide their own perspectives with the review is critically important. We will identify schools that may need more substantive intervention. So those schools where there are more significant gaps in their Title IX programming. And we will share with all schools who participate a model policy, template communications, training materials, and other written templates and, and workflows so that they can use those as they build their Title IX programs. Um, finally, our aim is to provide quality training to individuals within each ed educational institution about how uh, effective practices in the Title IX space may work so that they can custom tailor those to their educational community. Maureen already spoke of the survey legal requirements as well as the identification of relevant educational institution. This is a slide that reflects where we are on these things, how far we've come and what we've completed. Moving to the next slide in light of our time here today, deliverable three would be the kickoff meetings and we've been engaged in working group meetings with the county on at least two dates to discuss the format, content and timing to understand that we don't know what we don't know about certain things and to listen so that we can be best effective um, to kick off the in-person consultation and discussions. We have also been working with the County Office of Education to discuss the structure, format and organization. And you can see we've had consultations thus far with the individuals on the screen, Superintendent Mary Juwan, consultation with Jessica Bonjoris, and the Educational um, Services Division, Title IX Coordinator, Superintendent, as well as a consultation with district uh, superintendents. So we've been working to get that settled and to inform our thinking as we move through these next steps. Leslie? Thank you, I'm cognizant of time, so I'll move very high level through the next few slides. Uh, we are now at the level of preparing the kickoff meetings as you can see from the deck, we've been giving great thought into how to structure them, who should attend, what format should be. And in our conversations, uh, we have evaluated and we'll be preparing kickoff meetings at, based on how the districts are organized. So one for the K to eight, one for the high school only, and one for the unified school district, as well as additional meetings for the charters and the diocesan schools that exist within um, the county to ensure that the private through independents, whether or not they have uh, Title IX requirements or not, um, we generally find that they don't. The content of the kickoff meeting would include an overview of the engagement, the expectations for engagement, and really seek to demystify the process um, to help encourage participation by sharing our values, our approach. The goal is really to raise functioning on each and every one of the campuses as opposed to be a uh, more critical audit, if you will. Not to say that the audit won't identify challenges, but the, identif the, the goal is to how do we identify strengths and move that through. And then to walk through some of the other um, key pieces around the benefits of participation in the review, which for us most significantly are the things that Maureen outlined is the ability for each school to walk away with an enhanced toolkit, as well as the opportunity for them to ask questions throughout the kickoff meetings about the process itself. Maureen has been deeply engaged in preparing the survey. The goal for the survey is that it would be a very light lift for the schools. 
uh, and that the it would be able to supplement the publicly available information. Uh, we've got some technological gifts in the background, working with Smartsheet and other uh, IT solutions to be able to have that information auto-populate and then to be able, at the conclusion of our process, to prepare back for each institution uh, a, an individualized assessment and then to be able to share with those counties the individualized assessments for each school as well as an overview of the common themes and aggregate concerns. Gina, if you want to wrap on uh, community engagement, then we can turn to questions. Surely, recognizing that how we do is as important as what we do. The community engagement is a significant area that we've been giving a lot of attention, how to speak with those we serve, how to prepare and reach survivors, those accused administrators, and those carrying the responsibilities of these efforts. So we have fashioned four uh, ways to access uh, the community engagement. One is through an open email address um, that can be accessed. One is through a written survey to be disseminated. One is to uh, occur, uh, start with open focus groups, uh, schedule op open focus groups. And the last one is to have open office hours, likely by Zoom, um, given the volume of individuals that we are seeking to meet with. And so this is a starting point for our community engagement, and we will continue to give a lot of thought to how we communicate and how we do this as much as uh, the substance of what we're doing. Just concluding on time frame, if this is a very aggressive timeline that we're seeking to uh, conclude, but essentially moving first through the phase two, which is our K-12 schools, with the hope to have a deliverable back to the county um, no later than November, but hopefully earlier in the fall. Phase three is going to start concurrently over the summer with a conclusion by between December of 2023 and March of 2024. And then final report, uh, development of template policies and uh, other pieces for the entire conclusion of the engagement to be by March or June of 2024. And with that, we'll turn it back to uh, the committee for any additional questions or clarification that we can provide. Great, thank you. I'm gonna ask if there are any public speakers that are online. I have one hand raised online. We'll take that public speaker and then we'll go to those in the audience. Would you like to take the in-chambers public speaker as well? No, no, I, yeah, oh. but I was gonna start online, online and first. then okay. go to our public. Our first speaker will be Michelle Dauber. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Michelle Dauber, please go ahead. You'll have to click once, there you are. Good morning, uh, this is Michelle Dauber. I'm a professor at Stanford Law School. First of all, let me say I'm absolutely thrilled that the county has retained um, Cousin O'Connor, I think that it's a wonderful opportunity to work with the absolute best of the best um, in this area, and I think we're very lucky. Um, second, I want to say that I would like to hear more from Gina and her team about um, how student and survivor feedback will be gathered, including potentially setting up any confidential reporting opportunity as of course would be consistent with law. And I know that will be complicated in the K-12 uh, space. Um, I see a lot in this presentation about consultations with administrators. I think that's very important. I think gaining their trust is key, but I also uh, want to see survivors um, included and given the chance to participate, not least of which for the legitimacy of the outcome of this review. Um, and third, to me, um, of course, I'm not the expert that Gina is, but to me, this timeline seems aggressive. I don't know what the contract calls for, but um, I think that we shouldn't rush this. It took us years to get this, um, as was said in the beginning. Uh, it's taken us three years to get to this point from the point at which this was proposed um, by a former supervisor, Cortezzi, uh, and myself, and I would really like to see at this point that um, that a sufficient time is allocated by the county to make sure that this is 
not just done, but done right, as I know Gina and her team can do. So those are my comments and questions. Thank you. All right, anybody else online? Nope, all right, well then John Sweeney, welcome. Good morning, dear Chairperson Chavez, County Supervisors and staff. On behalf of the County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Marion Dewan and the Santa Clara County Office of Education, we would like to register our support and partnership to understand educational institutions compliance with laws regarding sex and gender harassment. Santa Clara County Office of Education is proud to have provided significant training and support for our K-12 schools and are committed to this partnership to learn and expand the resources available to all educational institutions. We are encouraged by this effort and hope to see ongoing collaborative resources and supports for our K-12 schools. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me start, I'm gonna close the public hearing and I'm gonna uh, then go to Gina. Did you, Gina, do you wanna respond to um, what Professor Dauber asked about? Um, so yes, of course, I, I think first I'm gonna go in backwards order. The timeline is aggressive um, and we will do the work um, the way we always do it, thoughtfully, comprehensively, and iteratively. And so there may be times where we are expecting to have the responses gathered or expecting to have had the participation um, and the timelines met and the information uh, synthesized um, that we would have to uh, report. And we have had such wonderful exchanges already with everyone who's represented the county about the process and we've received efficient and timely feedback. I, I don't think that will change and it is my expectation that if we need more time on certain areas um, that we will be uh, comfortable, ready, willing and able to articulate the need for the change or the adjustment and the reasons why and communicating back to those who are impacted by the extension of time, the reasons why and when we expect to get back on track. So yes, it's aggressive, but it is aggressive um, in, an, in a way that we think is manageable and we will stay in close contact all along the way. Um, as it relates to uh, speaking with constituent groups, and I think that um, it's worth saying again that those we serve are the reason we're here, our students, and in particular, getting access to their experiences is critical. In conducting many reviews of this nature, we often have opportunities for individuals to speak privately and to have their identity maintained um, in a de-identified anonymous way so that we can lift up the experiences, inform the thinking, inform the feedback, and inform the recommendations coming forward out of the audit. So we have every expectation to allow individuals, and in particular, uh, Professor Dauber, your question about individual survivors, to have that opportunity. We outlined, as I shared earlier in the PowerPoint, the ways we are seeking to get engagement. Um, we will assess how well that is working and we will further assess any additional opportunities, recognizing that even some in-person opportunities may be the only way that individuals would feel comfortable. And so we're going to start with the methods that we have to reach individual constituents and open it up to confidential, de-identified, anonymous opportunities, particularly of survivors and those who are impacted by the process. Thank you. Leslie, anything more on that? No, I just, I wanna share the uh, fundamental piece of the way that we do our work, particularly in a review of this nature, is to provide individuals the ability to speak without attribution. So in any accounts that are shared with us, we hold the identity of those individuals private um, we've recently concluded uh, a, a very large survey that was disseminated electronically, had about 18,000 responses. In addition to that, um, 
there was a, a different uh, engagement, but we expect and hope that we would have similar levels of engagement here within the county. In addition to that, as we shared in the PowerPoint, there is an email address that is open now. It is uh, ready and accessible and happy to take any and all feedback through that email, as well as individuals can uh, share their perspective about the process with us. So just noting that the process is intentionally designed to allow individuals to speak freely and to allow us to then be able to gather and aggregate the themes and the concerns or observations that are contained within that broader evidence base. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just dive in and then turn to um, my colleague for additional comments. Uh, first, just I, I want to make sure I understand just from a process perspective that um, Casey, this your your office is the lead, so your this is going to rest in your office. Yes, your person. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and then, if I could, I'm going to ask that the the slides get re um, attached to. I did the, note that. Yes, yeah. absolutely. We'll follow up. Thank you, and also get resent to both um, Supervisor Arenas and I, if we can, now because we can use them in the meeting. Um, if I could ask you to go to. Um, slide 10. Uh, okay, that's me, not slide 10. All right. And I don't have it in my packet, which is why I'm asking for it to be called up. Great. All right, so I want to just talk a little bit about outreach and um, and I, I also just want to note, and I, I know um, uh, Sylvia uh, Gallegos is not here, but I, I did want to say a very special thank you to Sylvia and the staff for getting this contract um, underway. I know what we're asking the consultants to do is something slightly different than what they've done before, and so I really just want to say to the consultants how much I appreciate you leaning in to do something different. And, uh, you know, and frankly, I hope we're all going to learn from this. But let me just talk for a moment about outreach. You know, I want to make sure that when we are measuring our effectiveness on outreach, that we're measuring that um, throughout the entire county and that we are mindful that we know that we have some um, schools that are going to be less resourced than others, and that that may require us to have different tacks to get um, information and engagement. And one um, concern that I just want to raise is that I think it will be important for us to consider whether or not we need to have a place, not just an online place, but an actual space um, that is going to be available to uh, young people irrespective of where they are in the county. And what that could mean is partnering with an organization like the Young Women's Freedom Center or even our own neighborhood services um, partnership that we have through probation where, where young people are used to coming anyway and that we're able to um, engage them. The second is that um, we have a very rich network of nonprofit partners that are providing services, and I didn't see them referenced in any of the, the slides or materials, and, and even our own, we have our own um, county staff that are providing services to victims of this age group. Yes. So, Casey, I'm just going to, I'm looking at you because you're here, <laughs> and I'm looking at you kind of fuzzy because I can't find my glasses, but nonetheless, <laughs> there you are. Um, if, if you could just help me understand how we're utilizing the resources that are already available to us. Uh, that's a great question, Madam Chair. So as you know, I'm very familiar with the Victim Services Unit and the nonprofit partners who work with victims of crime, particularly are survivors of sexual violence. One of the slides did note engagement with our confidential victim service providers as part of the engagement with our K through 12 and also our university setting. Um, it did not specifically state victim services, but I think that's a great point that we can also add while we are doing outreach to our confidential service providers, many of whom are providing services particularly at our K through 12 
high schools and higher education that we add the victim services unit um, to that survey to better understand the services that they provide and any gaps potentially um, in enforcement or education. I think the other um, the other group that I I was a little surprised. I mean, just something for us to think about is sure. the child advocacy center. Absolutely. And I and to me again. Um, you know that that's such a great. Um, it 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 has a lot of benefits to it, but including that, it may be a safe place for both children and families to be able to have conversations if that becomes necessary. So, I I want to just make sure we're we're we've started to really invest in this area of work and mm -hmm. want to make sure we're utilizing it. So, however that transpires, I'm just going to be very interested in understanding how we're doing that outreach and who's at the table. Um, the other thing I was thinking a little bit about is that we have nonprofit partners that are doing work in education that are not our confidential uh, informants, but who, I mean, confidential, yeah, services, um, but who have lots and lots of conversations with children and with families. And again, I'm focused a little bit on the east side because I'm concerned about language barriers, cultural mm -hmm. barriers, and we do have some very trusted nonprofit partners that um, I want to make sure we're at least as we're talking to the consultants can better understand how and when they've done that in other places in the country, what the outcome has been and who they might recommend. And in, in particular, I'm thinking a little bit about um, the, the folks who are providing services for our homeless families as well. You know, so anyway, we have a lot of, we have a pretty rich network and I wanna make sure they get integrated. I think that's a great point. And as to your first point about the Children's Advocacy Center, as we're thinking about trauma-informed care and practices, that location was designed and developed specifically with the well-being of survivors and especially our youngest survivors in mind. So as we're thinking about a meeting location or a place to meet with them and conduct interviews, I think the Children's Advocacy Center is a perfect solution. Um, one other thing that, that I would want us to think about is, um, and this would be interesting to get, you know, again, the consultants when you have a chance to sit with them in a room and talk this through. I also think that I, I'm just really interested in the rich network we have of service providers that are providing medical services. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Gartner, Gartner Health Center, right. Aki. Because mm -hmm. again, where we have people who are providing counseling, we should sure. just, they should know about this, be able to give input to it. And we have, again, both with our behavioral health service providers and our medical service providers, they both have excellent um, um, organizations that that convene them. You know, they're, they're um, anyway, so that's also a place to get the information out that this opportunity is available and then to get their feedback on how they'd like to give input to it. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and then on the developing the model policies and templates and trainings, uh, you know, one question that perhaps you got answered already is where do these, where do these kinds of services live online where people can draw them down. And what I'm thinking specifically about is, obviously the County Office of Education for Schools is a place they would obviously go. But what about, um, will there be a separate kind of website where all this material will be living and schools will be able to access it and the community can access it? Yes, so one of the uh, recommendations is that at the conclusion of the study in the final report, that any of our training materials, templates um, that the county may be providing is that it's accessible online in one location for all of our districts. Um, so again, for ease of access. And so the, the plan would be to have all the policies and templates um, and also the updates to Title IX as we discussed that there might be some updates coming in the legal review. All of that would be available in one location for anybody who might want to access it. So what I would want to just think about is again, for the county, I think it would be important for us to have one location that a college or an elementary school, anybody can come to the to the county. So if we can figure out how to put that website somewhere that, you know, whether, I, I don't have a preference, but just yeah. you all will think about that. And then making it available. So for example, the County Office of Education could make it available to anybody from zero to, you know, to 12th grade. So I don't mind if everybody wants to take it for themselves, but I do want to have one location that all of that material lives. By the way, not just for our community, but other communities throughout the country. I think one thing we've learned is that we learn a lot from our, our partners in other parts mm -hmm. of the nation as well. Um, and so I'd want to make this available to them so that, you know, again, we would have access to their materials. Sure. Um, and then 
uh, I think the, the only other um, question I have is um, just with the consultants, and maybe this is something, again, that can be got back to us at a later point, mm -hmm. is do we have a point person that's physically here uh, for this project? It, me and because I, I actually it was interesting to have everybody online today and and you know and I'm but anyway so do will we have somebody who's here they their intention was to be here in person when the meeting got rescheduled unfortunately they weren't able to yeah that's not yeah. a problem I just meant is there one is there somebody going to be physically here like if we did have a location that people could drop in and give feedback absolutely yeah we would make sure to have someone and we, we recognize that this project is a priority to our community and to the board um, and so as a deputy county executive, I'll be the county representative at all of these conversations and presentations and outreach events. So we're taking a very active role um, along with our contractors to ensure that we have robust community engagement and that there's a face of the county there and a provider in person. Um, we know a lot of people have gotten used to virtual presentations and virtual engagement, but we would like to make as much available in person as possible. So what it would be great for us to understand is, in addition to you from our non I mean, from our contract partner, who the other partner is that will be present here, and mostly because I I want to make sure if people are talking to me, I can obviously send them to you. But I also think there may be some folks who, for whatever reason, would like to talk to that consultants. They're going to see them as more neutral outside the norm, and so that's really why I was asking. It was less about. Just, but who? Who do I send them to? And I, and we'll I think one person for you. Yeah, and what I would recommend again is that we send that information to the whole board, so that the board's aware of that. That would be great. Yes, Chair. Sylvia, I'm sorry for monopolizing, but I feel like I was channeling Dave there just to make sure we got it all done. No, th thank you so much for asking all those questions. And I'm actually going to just uh, continue with, with one of those points that you were making about um, engagement. Um, and I saw the different modalities that. Um, that we're going to be used to engage folks. Um, and I wonder if we could include a text messaging mm -hmm. in that, um, especially because I, I saw that there were gonna be open office hours but through Zoom and I know that um, the, the, the chair just talked about how important it is to have a physical location. I agree, I, um, I think folks, um, when they're compelled to share, they want it to be in person. Um, but I also recognize that there's a lot of uh, folks who don't <laughs> and would like to just uh, share their information via text, um, which is something that has is, is, uh, been facilitated through this pandemic, is that, that uh, uh, access to folks through, to, through text messaging. And so I, I wonder if we could include that in that. I think that's a great point, especially since we're talking about K through 12 and some of our youth and early 20s. Texting is a really common way um, that everybody communicates. I think that's a wonderful point and we can work with our contractors. Wonderful. Um, and I, I think all the really great questions have already been answered, I mean, uh, asked. Um, I just wonder about the identi identification of schools needing more uh, substantive intervention. Um, challenges and uh, I, I know that that um, uh, Coase and O'Connor's come in with a very um, um, humbling approach in terms of recognizing that they don't know what they don't know um, and I, I know that one of the things that we know is where there is sexual abuse and how are they going to um, uh, maybe target some of those schools that need more substantive intervention challenges. Is that going to be through just some of that exchange that they're going to naturally have with some of those school districts? Or is data, I'm, I'm obviously thinking data is going to also yeah. guide them. Yeah, so they've done a public review of the policies and procedures for our different districts. Um, but certainly to your point about the data where there are districts where the abuse is higher, that information is fairly readily available through the district attorney's office. Um, and so that is information that we can gather to help us target those um, areas of higher need. 
And then in the final report, that is one of the areas that we'll be working on is the survey of identifying the districts that might need more support. We really want this to, and in our work with Dr. Dewan, I do want to thank the superintendent um, for meeting with me on multiple occasions as we've worked through uh, this collaborative relationship to better understand what support they might need from us and how they would best prefer to receive that support if we do identify um, a gap need. And mm -hmm. so that's something we're working very closely with our superintendents on. Great. So is there already an agreement with, uh, because county office of ed is very separate from all the school districts. They are. Mm -hmm. um, and so they don't naturally have a role to play in this. How are they building that relationship with the school districts in order to really meaningful, uh, have a meaningful engagement? Um, because yeah. there's no there's no enforcement. There's sure. no, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're providing a lot of the support, so it would be silly for school districts not to engage, but they can still do that. They can. And so the kickoff meetings that we've been having um, that we're scheduling now, but also the introductory meetings that we've had with the superintendents um, and also with Dr. Dewan have really been about, um, for lack of a better term, a hearts and minds tour, like really helping them to understand that our intention is good. It's to support our schools and our districts and ultimately to support our community. Mm -hmm. And that is really at the heart of this. Um, and I can, you know, certainly we can have um, Ms. Hannah Weir answer any of the legal questions, but the county's role in enforcing Title IX is, is limited, but we certainly can provide support and resources. And so those kickoff meetings will be the closer relationships with the individual districts. And some have already reached out to us through the meetings with the superintendents to say, we could use some help. We're smaller, we need additional services, we're looking forward to engagement. Um, so, so far the, the feedback that we've gotten has been positive. And if we identify any schools that need a little bit more support, a little bit more resources, a little bit more hands-on um, engagement, then we will certainly make ourselves available to do that. That's wonderful to hear. I love this tour, this hearts and mind <laughs> tour. Um, I think that we, as uh, policymakers and representatives of our own um, respective districts, um, have those relationships, or some of us have relationships with the school districts. And I would recommend also um, to engage us in case um, there's some school districts that are not responding for whatever reason. It's not um, because they don't want to participate, simply because, like you said, they might be very small and just overwhelmed with all of the needs. And I, we know that behavioral, um, the behavioral uh, needs of our uh, youth are just mm -hmm. really impacted right now. So I'm happy to put myself out there. I don't want to speak for the rest of the board, but I think that it would be a natural um, way to utilize our offices. Um, and I think for me, I think that's, I think I, I'm, I'm okay with the rest of, um, I think those were the end of my questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Great, you. thank you. Um, I do want to just add one one thing that um, that I was thinking about as you were speaking. I, I think you're right that, that so there's been a balance here. Some of us, and I would put myself in this category, have been thinking very much about how we get folks who aren't complying with Title IX to comply. And I think what the consultants have been really mindful of with us is that they, they want to build a trusting relationship so that the schools understand that our goal is to help them comply, not to, mm -hmm. not to be punitive. Although, and, and I'm not saying that to you, I'm saying this out loud about me, <laughs> which is I've been feeling, especially as we're dealing with the colleges, uh, uh, very differently about how choices that they're making that don't make sense to me as an outsider relative to how they're following up on on these complaints. And so what I, I just wanted to say out loud to the consultants is that you you have done a good job of moving me to more understanding that this is really about building a trusting relationship really, especially with K through 12. And at the same time, we are trying to raise the level of accountability throughout the county in terms of our obligations to keep people, especially kids, safe on their campuses, period. And so as we move forward, one of the questions that I'm going to just make sure that we're focused on is answering the question about what is the right balance and long term, what is the right role? 
because I, I personally don't feel like that exists right now for exactly the reasons that, that um, Supervisor Adenas was just saying in terms of whose job it is to make sure that the schools are actually complying, what, what do the compliance strategies look like, and, and at the same time, we have some schools that we're not, we're not even funding nearly enough to do the, what they would consider the basics, and we're asking them to play a leadership role in addressing this. So I, I think as we, um, as the report backs come, and the reason I wanted to keep them on this agenda is I do think we wanna be able to understand um, both what the school's perspectives are, the students' perspectives are, and, and then helping all of that, helping us to lead to climates on campuses where, where um, rape is not an option, sexual assault is not an option, it's just Absolutely. not happening, right? That, like, so this is a piece of a bigger wheel of work that we're doing countywide, um, and the schools are really important to us in that. So I just wanted the consultants to know I heard you, that I'm <laughs> dialing it back a little bit. And, um, for our nonprofit partners, I, I do want to add that I think we should be specific about engaging Planned Parenthood and specific about engaging CARA. And I thought, um, again, Sylvia, your point about texting, I, I think there are young people who spend a whole day not using their voice. So I, I think that is just such a brilliant point. And we've actually started to use that for 911 for exactly that reason. And um, in Planned Parenthood, the reason that popped into my head after, um, Sylvia, after you raised that is, they have got a really good rapid response for young people texting them for questions and appointments. So we actually have a partner we can learn from right here, and so you were right on. I think that 100%, I'm so so grateful that you raised that because there are kids we would have missed had you not raised it, so good. So ask them for help is my point. All right, so Chavez, we- Chavez, may I? Um, I'm sorry, it's, off, it's so awkward remotely. Curious. May I just speak very briefly? Who, who's uh, I just talking? Wanted to, <clears throat> this is Leslie Gomez. Okay, great, Leslie. Thank you. I just wanted to um, thank both you and uh, Vice Chair Reynas for all of your thoughtful comments. Um, a couple of pieces of background that you may have known from the selection process, but might not have been front of mind at the moment. Gina, Maureen, and I all hail from the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, where we served uh, for the first half of our professional careers as sexual and gender-based um, violence prosecutors and importantly, um, significant investigation and understanding of issues as they relate to child abuse. Uh, I ran the juvenile court unit for five years in Philadelphia, which uh, focused on all crimes impacting juveniles, whether as a delinquent or um, as a, a victim of a crime or survivor of a crime. And so things like the Child Advocacy Center are very near and dear to our heart. Gina actually serves on a, a board called the Support Center for Child Advocates in Philadelphia. And um, those are excellent suggestions for how to think about moving forward. The other piece I wanted to share is uh, very much here and reflect the importance of hearing from confidential resources, uh, whether it be your school counselors, the health services providers, but also more broadly, um, those community organizations who often are placed in the role of being an advocate for uh, a student or a uh, faculty or staff member who is impacted. And so, that is very much a part of our planned outreach, and we often get sort of the best and most cogent information from advocates who work day in and day out to support individuals in the process. And then lastly, uh, we will continue to explore one of our campus, uh, one, actually one of the campuses within your district now, um, San Jose State University does use a texting platform within their Title IX and gender equity program. And um, we will dive in to explore what availabilities there are on our end to include those people. But really wanted to, to thank um, both the chairperson and the vice chairperson for your engagement and your commitment to these issues. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask that we um, move approval of the receipt of this report with the recommendations that were made by the committee. As so moved. And I'll second that. And um, Jess, I took good notes for you. So. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm sure my staff did too. All right, so we'll take a vote. Vice Chairperson Arenas? Yes. Chairperson Chavez? Yes, thank you. Um, colleagues, uh, we, I, I did not manage our meeting well today, so I'm not only without glasses, but also without time management skills today. So um, we have um, a number of items that are on the agenda, and what I would like to do is, um, for the rest of them, 
if uh, staff, if it's okay, we're, we'll ask questions unless one of the board members wants to have a presentation. So I'll just apologize in advance for that. All right, and I didn't look to you guys to get your feedback on that last item and I apologize for that. Is there anything that anybody wanted to raise? And I'm really not trying to rush you. That was super, super important. We hadn't di dug into it. So is there anything else that we should be thinking about? No? All right. All right, so we're gonna go to item uh, seven. This is adult protective services. And if I could ask the team up forward on this. And on this one, would you like a presentation? Because this is actually, this, this isn't. Good. Well, this time, so we will not need a presentation on this. I just wanted to ask a few questions, and I wanted to say thank you. I thought the presentation was very, very, very helpful. Um, I had some kind of longer-term questions based on the the um, participation increase that we're seeing, and I wanted to ask: Are there additional um, state laws that you see perhaps coming down the line that will drive our need for more? staffing or different support services for your team and everybody can introduce themselves and then whoever responds great and I'm sorry you all look fuzzy and lovely but I can't see who I'm looking at really and these don't help I'm Marianne Warren I'm the director of the Department of Aging and Adult Services and I'm here with my colleagues Valerie Smith Marta Waquez and Tracy Coleman and I'll defer to Valerie on this one good morning thank you for your question um, again, my name is Valerie Smith. I'm a program manager with Adult Protective Services. So um, I think you're referring to AB 135, which was legislation that was um, uh, implemented in January of 2022, this year. Um, I'm sorry, last year. <laughs> and I think um, what's happening at the state level from our perspective is that the state is very invested in aging and adult services and expanding um, services, and they have um, an initiative, the Master Plan for Aging, where they are creating um, several uh, subcategories and are making recommendations to the state about init initiatives that they um, are trying to bring forward to support more. So AB 135 was actually a product of uh, the Master Plan for Aging. So um, I don't know what else they're looking at right now. I know elder justice is something that they're really focused on, um, as well as abuse in nursing homes, at, which is not part of APS's jurisdiction, but we're partners with the long-term care ombudsman who does investigate those allegations of abuse. Do you want to add anything? So that's, that is really helpful. I, I, part of the reason what caught my attention was just recognizing that the popu you know, our senior population is really gonna continue to grow, and I just had a birthday recently, so it made me think about it even more. Seriously, um, but as that population grows, one of the concerns that I have, and, it, and I think this is a good thing, we're doing better outreach to educate people about what numbers to call, and I think that, that's part of what's happening. But I also think just the sheer volume of people that are aging and are gonna be in a more challenged situation potentially is something we should be focused on. And Javier Becerra, when he was the Attorney General, had an emphasis on it, trying to expand um, services in this area because he saw that as a priority area. I don't know if AG Bonta is also looking at um, playing an expanded role, but my request to all of you would be, if you haven't done it, if you could sit with um, David Campos, who is our, you know, playing a, a part with uh, um, Danielle Christian in our legislative outreach, I think it would be really important both to give him your perspective on what you're learning about the needs of the population, and also to make sure we're tracking that, because what I am concerned about is that counties are gonna be responsible for a really hugely growing population without the resources attached to it. And so I think being able to make sure that while he's doing his rounds, especially for our delegation, that we're informing them about what we're seeing you know, happening with the adult and the senior population is gonna be critical. I'm, I'm worried that this is gonna, I know that you all, and I know Diana Miller, and I know that the county has played a leadership role in really thinking about 
um, how we're addressing senior health in our community, but I do not feel like that's a statewide issue. And in all of the meetings I've had, not just with our delegation, but statewide, I've only had one legislator bring this up to me, one. And that's worrying me quite a lot. Um, could you, have you all already met with um, David and Danielle? No. 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 Not that um, I'm aware of. Deborah, are you comfortable with them doing that? Uh, yes, we can do that, sure. That would be great. And then at some point, I think, even as it relates to that legislative agenda, I know when those discussions come back to the board, it's listed on our list, but we're not actively pursuing it. I'd just be interested in any ideas that you have when you're talking to David about where you think we should be making investments. The reason I'm particularly interested in this area is I, I do think we're going to see more scam artists and others preying on this population because they're going to see it's growing too and they're opportunistic and sort of ugly and I and I think having a conversation also with our district attorney because they're starting to see increases in cases would be really important. Yeah. And I think as we learn more about the master plan as Valerie alluded to earlier and the initiatives associated with it there may be some legislation or not associated with that I think the state is just exploring the various components of what that will look like. Uh, and so we have Valerie and I know Marianne attend those meetings. They're part of those statewide groups. And so they stay close to that. But again, we'll work with David to educate him uh, from the legislative standpoint as well. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also, uh, we all recognize that the, the, the pool of aging adults is, is going to get larger. Um, and with that comes a uh, greater number, just like uh, Madam Chair just mentioned, um, more propensity for that financial um, fraud uh, and abuse um, from not only family members, but from unknown folks. And this just comes with human development. It's just natural for elders to fall for some, some of that abuse and to, um, and, and to no fault of their own, right? It's just that's part of human development. Um, and so because we know that, um, we, we want to step ahead of it, right? And so I'm wondering what are some of the prevention strategies that you're using um, either through uh, our PIOs or campaigns before um, aging adults get to a point where they're going to be more susceptible because of their age that they recognize and understand, or maybe even have already some strategies put into place by family members or folks that they already trust. Um, and I, I, I guess I'm not seeing that um, in the report. How are we anticipating um, interrupting some of that? Thank you for your question. Um, we, I wanna backtrack a little bit. We do, we do actually have a, um, very well-respected multidisciplinary team called the Financial Abuse Specialist Team, where APS partners with the Office of the Public Guardian, as well as the District Attorney's Office and County Council. And um, what's significant about our team in Santa Clara County, many counties have uh, what we call a FAST team. Um, however, what's significant about ours is a rapid response. So ours is an actual response team, not just um, a consultative team. So the members actually go out and um, oftentimes, you know, abuse may be occurring or may not have occurred yet. It's, it sort of varies with some of the reports that we get. And so that is one of um, our, our most successful interventions is when we can partner um, with our uh, other agencies that, um, where we all have a similar goal. And so we do a lot of education and outreach just on that. Um, uh, the, the FAST team actually was invited to present at the National Adult Protective Services Association conference last August, where they um, presented their strategies to a national audience and were um, well, highly respected and well, um, uh, well received um, for the work that they're doing because it is unique. So um, that, is, that is one way. Um, we are looking to um, create a uh, time-limited position with some federal funds that we're getting through the American Rescue Plan for a project manager position to do more outreach, because that is an area that we haven't been able to expand as much as we would like to. 
um, <clears throat> excuse me, and part of that role would be um, creating a community newsletter and also um, kind of organizing some events. Um, we do also have an annual World Elder Abuse um, Awareness Day outreach event. It's June 15th every year, and this year we're doing um, a shredded event in partnership with um, AARP. Mm -hmm. So um, people can come, and the, and the thought is that, you know, your confidential documents, such as financial documents, can be easily um, stolen or accessed if you don't destroy them, you know, in a confidential way. So um, this, is, this is another way we're, we're addressing that issue. Thank you. No, I, I did see that in the report, and I apologize if I didn't mention that. I thought that was fabulous. Um, I have boxes <laughs> of stuff in my uh, garage that um, I have not shredded, because one day I will have that time to do that. And so I think this is absolutely fabulous to do. I, I do think that um, because this is a response, this is um, in response to to somebody's request, call, concern, um, uh, that it's not necessarily for the masses. And so I'm, I'm really glad to hear that there's going to be a, a position, a uh, project manager that is going to expand some of that outreach. And what I was thinking about is, is a campaign that talks to seniors um, and maybe not the AARP, which is what most of us, and I refuse to uh, reply to their emails, um, their attempts to engage me, <laughs> Madam Chair, um, as I am only 49. <laughs> it's, it's the new 39, okay? That's what I keep telling myself. Anyways, <clears throat> enough about me. What I was, <laughs> what I was uh, uh, trying to make a point here about is that there's so many of our seniors who are taking care of our children, who are in our community, who are very active and can receive some of this information um, through newsletters that go through our school districts, that go through our newsletters through our offices, that. We can just um, uh, really inundate them with some campaign information about how to protect themselves beforehand. Now, I think shredding is, is actually um, something that I should pick up and ha haven't done so, um, and I think a lot of people will take advantage of that, but I just wonder, um, would this new project manager be able to um, have some strategies for the masses? Will, will that be something that they will focus on? If not, I, I would be interested in, in yeah, recommending that. Yeah, that is the that. hope. That is the, that is the reason um, why we have requested to, and it's a time-limited position because it is one-time funds, but um, we're hoping that they can uh, engage the community and start some of those processes so that then we can carry it on after the position um, it ends. Um, but yes, that is that is exactly what why we were asking for the position. That, that's wonderful, and I think um, w with the wealth that is in the generation that is is retiring and continuing to retire, um, I fear for for their wealth um, uh, because you know they, they they've worked so hard to pass it on to their next generation, and and it's um, on the line. Um, and so, and there's a lot of folks who, who also uh, may not trust the banks, but um, also have their own savings, and how do we protect those folks, and how do they, how do we put some measures in place before folks get to a certain age where they're going to be more susceptible to abuse, and now we're just responding to a case. Um, uh, so, so thank you so much for, for listening um, to my suggestions, and also my my, my own um, <laughs> my own path uh, to getting older so so thank you uh, and then uh, do we do a I, I'm gonna move this this item can I, can I just add one more thing um, we also work with the Bay Area Social Services Consortium and there is talk among the DOS directors throughout that about doing a countywide um, sort of prevention focus and it's being talked about and explored, and uh, no action plans have been made yet, but we're meeting in two or three weeks, and we'll discuss it further then. Oh, that's Countywide or region-wide? The nine Bay Area counties. That's a, I, 
Yeah, I mean, if we needed to bring something as part of budget to pitch in a little bit to be part of that, it makes so much more sense. It really yeah. does. I mean, we. I think the point that um, Supervisor on Ennis raised about the kinds of just trickery people get, you get them on your phones all the time and you know, it, you have to process, did I order something from such mm -hmm. and such, right? So I mm -hmm. think that is a really, really good idea. And the one request I would make is engage the district attorney's office in it as mm -hmm. well, because all the district attorney's offices have a, a unit that deals with fraud, mm -hmm. and they also do communication. And so maybe being able to bundle up those resources would be a way to be able to do something in the nine barrier counties. I think that's really smart. The um, elder fraud deputy district attorney is part of our FAST team. So we, we, we do have a close relationship with the DA's office. And one thing we might want to do is have a more formal discussion with them about leading the nine Barrier County DAs and having the same conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, they all have their own, not, you know, they don't have huge budgets, but they have their own resources that they're using for communication and we should actually be leveraging them. Very good. Well, we'll look forward to you know, if you wouldn't mind, just give us an off agenda and let us know how that's going in the next few months. And then second, I would just say, please make sure that each of our offices get materials that are social media ready to go mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. um, because we send out newsletters all the time. And one thing I was really surprised at is that we we have done a countywide newsletter since COVID started and we it's kind of news you can use. I'm, we have a lot of people who, um, who open those. So if you get us information both about the shredding event and uh, anything else that's camera ready, oh, not camera ready, wow, that's old school. Just <laughs> email it to us, we'll, we'll fix it. All right, good, well we have a motion and I'll make a second. And any comments from anybody? Deborah, did you wanna add anything? No, I think we have a strategy. I would just add that we also have the senior agenda who convenes uh, you know, several events throughout the year, and that's another way to distribute the information. Yeah, that's, those are great events, and they're well attended. Good. All right, we have a motion and a second. Vice Chairperson Arenas? Yes. Chairperson Chavez? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for your good work. All right, we're going to go on to item eight, and this is our CAN Center report. And I'm, as the staff comes forward, I'm going to ask if... Uh, if on the CAN Center you have any questions that you'd like to raise, yeah, then we'll go ahead and start. Do you want them to do a presentation or questions? Questions? Go ahead. I'm going to let you start. Yeah, go ahead. So, through the chair, I'm going to begin with my um, uh, comments and, and some questions. Um, I thought this was a really interesting report um, and, um, and something that, that I was actually had been thinking about. So it was, um, as a council member, we had um, a couple of school districts that just came to us and were, were very concerned about the flood of, of uh, abuse that was going to um, um, develop or unfold in their school districts um, as the pandemic uh, isolated us for a very long time, especially children from a trusted adult, which typically can be somebody at school. And so um, <clears throat> this has been kind of in the back of my mind. What we did at the city level was connect some of those school districts with um, the the Child Advocacy Center and those folks who who have um, um, so that they can create some really direct uh, relationships. But going back to this, the the canned calls, um, I it left me wanting to know more. Um, and and some of those that some of that information is. I know that we can get that from the UC Berkeley and the CDSS um, uh, Child Welfare Indicators Project, um, but I'm I'm hoping that we can integrate what we don't see here and what we can click on there, so that we can have a full comprehensive presentation of the information. So for me, I felt that some of what was missing was. Um, how many, you know, the breakdown of the calls and the type of abuse, 
that was reported, the, the breakdown of the, uh, the, the type of abuse and the response time. Um, I wanted to know how many calls are coming in um, per child, um, as well as the age range for that. Um, and then I also wanted to know what the breakdown of the differential response organizations. I, I wanted to see how are we faring um, because I know this is just the calls, but it also begs that question about how how are we how are children faring, right? Um, and so I wanted to um, have a report that is available. That so my my motion will will be a report that it, um, has data available that is presented here, but also um, integrated integrate some of that information that I just um, mentioned that's also available through the UC Berkeley analysis that the board doesn't typically have access, well, we have access to it, it's just not presented in an integrated fashion. So I'm hoping that we can integrate that now. Um, and have um, the next, and Chair, I, I know this is an annual report and I don't know what guides that, um, but I was hoping that we could, um, for the time being, ask this to come back, uh, maybe for next quarter, um, so that I know there's a lag time between what is what is reported on on online in in the databases <clears throat> that I mentioned, um, and I think M M Michaela, you you mentioned to me that I think in September, all that information kind of gets unified. Correct. Is that my yeah? I might reflect it over accurately. to Deborah, but I think it's about a year lag. La lag yeah. for yeah. the state's reporting. Yeah. Good, good morning, Madam Vice Chair. Oh. This is Damian Wright, Assistant Sorry, Director, DFCS, uh, along with Tracy Bowers, one of our uh, program managers. Uh, you're exactly right in regards to uh, making sure that the data uh, that you're asking for is integrated in the report. Uh, there's other reports that actually come to this committee that actually address some of that, but we can combine that information and make sure that there's a synergistic explanation of why certain things look a certain way. Um, this particular report is really just based on the Child Abuse and Neglect Center calls that come in and how they're routed. Um, mm -hmm. But definitely we can make sure that that information is really clear in regards mm -hmm. to not only what we do internally, but also the information that's on our state website. I appreciate that, and I know that I think the original referral was because there was some concern about uh, the response time, and I saw that the response time is very much um, improved, and that's amazing that, that we can get to that many calls um, and, and evaluate out um, a, lot of, a lot of these calls, which means that um, either folks are getting some referrals or they just don't, it doesn't qualify or doesn't meet a certain criteria. Um, and I think, you know, or, or they could be calling for whatever other reason. They just happen to dial our number. Um, and so I, I, I completely um, get that, and I, I love that, that the response time has improved. Although for me, it just kind of begs the next question about how can we make this information a little bit more comprehensive. Um, and Madam Chair, I don't know if, if you're open to this, but I would love to bring it back um, in the next quarter so we can see what that integration of information looks like. So let me just make this request. I think, um, first of all, I'm really excited you're interested in this. Here would be my recommendation. What I would suggest is that perhaps, um, and Deborah, you all, and Damon, you can tell us the time frame. But before September, what we should do is a presentation on the, an overall presentation with some of the other reports that we have of what, how the system works, what that response looks like. And, and that would give us an opportunity to, to really just um, combine, because I do think when it comes in pieces, it, it, it's hard to see the whole picture. So to combine up reports that are already done, what I think would be of value is to bring the historic data of the uh, kind of where we started with this and where we are now. And this kind of aligns with changes in state law that have allowed us to have different responses for different kinds of calls for service. But I do think that this report had really intended to focus on, um, on our response, you know, picking up a phone. 
right? And making sure that we were responding, but adding that other component. And like, I, you're right, there are already reports. If, now here's what I would suggest. I wouldn't suggest doing a whole different, the only thing that I think would need to be different are slides, but attach them to the reports that we already have and not let's not wait till the next year's reports because to be frank with you, there's another issue that I would love to get um, uh, Supervisor Arenas' perspective on. Um, and it's something I was actually gonna raise under our joint uh, foster youth task force report out, um, but I'll raise it now, which is that I think it's also time that we're taking a look at um, both how quickly we're responding, how we're responding, and the, the, the um, what we're learning about the changes that, that how the changes we're making are really protective of children's well-being. And so from my perspective, being able to bundle this first half may help us be ready for that next set of questions that we want to answer. Because I think, you know, Sylvia's right that there's question A, question B, question C, and it just kind of bubbles up. But what I would say is if we can do that, Deborah, what I would recommend is if you could um, um, sit with uh, Supervisor Aranas to just design that report out, and then we'll have that report out, you know, at the next, if not the next meeting, the meeting after that would be great. Yeah, we can do that. We'll make sure that the team sense. is ready to sit down and, okay. and really help outline that report. I think the other piece is, is to how do we use the data now to determine the services? That's right? exactly I right. I think that's the question I'm hearing. And so the team can do that as well. Yeah. yeah. So we'll and, and I think that's going to require discussion and analysis, which is why I think being able to dig into this first layer of numbers will actually lead us there. And it's another set of partners that we would need to engage, including the courts and foster families and the like. And, and Madam Chair, I, um, I do want to share that I did request um, a, a hearing of s some sort, uh, in, in, I think in lieu of a study session, it's just so that we could see the, f uh, to our county exec for this very reason that you just mentioned, just to pull everything together. Um, because as I'm, I'm new, <laughs> as I'm learning through, I'm learning through the systems and through the committees, trying to put it all together. Um, and I thought, wouldn't it be great to have something more comprehensive? And so I did make that request, but I think. Well, you know, we, we actually, we, mm -hmm. can, we can do that here with all the subjects that are within our purview mm -hmm. and just do a briefing. And, and frankly, there's a benefit to doing a public briefing, which is that any of the folks who follow our work are gonna be able to put the pieces together themselves because if it's confusing for us, imagine for the public how overwhelming that is. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy to, you know, and I can work with um, with Deborah and, and you and Greta just to put the agenda together. And I think, I, I, and I would call it a study session, not really a hearing, but a study session so that we can, sure, yeah, mix and match. But we can do that. And in fact, I like that idea a lot. Okay, wonderful. Cool. Great. All right, Anything so else on this subject? No, so awesome. I only have. Can we do a motion? No. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, go interrupt ahead. your go ahead your questions. Move. Go ahead. <laughs> move to approve. And I'll second it. Um, here is one thing I'm going to request on this report. It is, I think, incredibly important to make sure we're looking at year over year data, and and both for how re, how we're responding in terms of speed and time, and then what we're responding to. Um, and the reason, you know, I had made a request and I said, hey, do you think you could do this? But I'm just gonna tell you the reason I think we need to do it is that um, we need to be looking at that 92% number and how high should we, uh, how high can we get it to? Um, I know we're at 92.5. I know that when I started, we were like at 60. And I know that you all did tremendous work, but I'm really wondering, should what's the right, is it 95, is it 96, and what can we get it to? What are the impediments to getting it there? But what I had a hard time doing is I needed to go back through a lot of the old reports to look at you know, where, where we are in that process. So any, in any case, I would just say if we could do a, a year over year just so we can track it would be really great. Like here's what you accomplished year one, here's what you accomplished year two. I, I know that we peaked at one point above where we are now and now we're dropping down, and that may be, there may be a really good natural reason for that, which is the types of calls we're getting are people wanting to go to voicemail instead of, um, instead of talking to somebody live, but that information isn't in here, and so I can't assess 
where we should be. Does that make sense, Damian? Definitely, Madam Chair. Yeah. We can really look at a comparative analysis over maybe the last several years to make sure that there's not only a review of where we are currently, but to make sure uh, some of the items that you spoke to, what are some of the impacts that are impacting our percentage rates? So. That, would be, that would be really great. Good. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Thank you. Please thank the team for their good work. Like, this is... This was so hard for you all, and now it's just like you're getting in there. And, the, and these are also, we have a lot of rule changes, so I know that that's also reflecting the responses and all that. So um, we'll look forward to doing some workshop that will include this. I'll work, Deborah, with you and Sylvia and um, Greta to pull something together and appreciate uh, the work being done. And so we'll go ahead. We have a motion and a second. We will act on this. Vice Chairperson Arenas? Yes. Chairperson Travis? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we're gonna to move to item nine, which is our welcoming center. Yes. And um, again, instead of a report, I know. <laughs> Don't move, you're right there. Um, Sylvia, did you have questions on this item? Um, I, I just have a couple. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, One of the questions is uh, about the challenges in finding uh, placement for a child within the 24 hours. And we're going to try to, I think that there was going to be an, uh, a potential extension uh, from um, in terms of the licensure uh, for DFCS uh, from, 20, from 48 hours to 72 hours stay. Um, and, and so I was just wondering, what what is... Is it is it the staffing that's limited? Is it is it the what is what is limiting us to placing children within a 24-hour time frame? Uh, really good question, uh, Vice Madam Chair. In regards to the impacts or uh, barriers in regards to placement for youth, it's usually related to the acuity of behavior. Uh, so definitely looking at. Uh, maybe 5% of our population, if not a little bit less, uh, of these youth that come through our welcoming center. Uh, the behaviors that these youth uh, usually display uh, definitely impact um, our ability to find placement. Uh, these youth usually go into what's called our short-term residential treatment programs, which are very high-level placements. Uh, these youth also probably go into some of our medical facilities, whether it's the uh, crisis stabilization unit and our, our four participating hospitals uh, that support around medical stabilization. So, so the behaviors are pretty uh, high in regards to extremity. Uh, definitely looking at uh, also the physical aggression is, is definitely a, a big piece to that in regards to some of these youth and, and substance use. Oh, and substance abuse, mm -hmm. got it. Um, What's the likelihood that we're going to extend the contract with Seneca? Uh, it's, it's highly likely, and it's really based on uh, CDSSs, or the state's uh, California Department of Social Services, um, turnaround time in regards to, one, our application, um, and two, in regards to uh, installing a, a group home program administrator. Uh, and so those two items, there's a turnaround time that needs to happen in regards to submittal or application process mm -hmm. uh, to approval. Okay, so that group home program administ administrator timeline looks like what? Uh, 60 to 90 days. Uh, that person is actually sitting right next to me. Uh, that application was submitted. So uh, we're just waiting on that uh, approval and then turnaround time to get the certificate. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Um, so I'm going to move to approve the report. So we have a motion, and I'll second it. And just a quick um, request that I would like to make is that um, could you make sure that as that when the next report comes out, or even if it's off agenda, I apologize, off agenda report that we um, include the the new facilities that are being reviewed? That would be great. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And do, we don't have any public speakers. No one here in the audience to speak. So we'll close the public hearing, and we'll go back. To for a vote. Vice Chairperson Arenas. Excuse me. Aye. Chairperson Chavez. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for getting us that information. All right. So we're now going to go to item 10. And this is the Joint Foster Youth Task Force recommendations. And um, I'm going to ask the staff to come forward who are working on these items. 
And I, th I think Dr. Dewan was here and had to leave. Yes, is that what happened? Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, Wendy, do you want to just give maybe a, a high level um, overview on where we are? And then I will turn to uh, Supervisor Anenas and then uh, come back to myself for questions. <laughs> Bless you. Sure, of course. And Dr. Uh, Wendy Kinnear Roush with Department of Family and Children's Services, one of the assistant directors for prevention and programs. Dr. Dewan sends her apologies. She had another meeting she had to be at for a quorum. So uh, we will do our best to answer the questions. So just a couple different things. We were coming back on the report backs from the Joint Foster Youth Task Force and a couple of the recommendations that you wanted more information on. Um, the first one was with regards to our partnerships from the CAN Center to community and the pass through to make sure that um, families these are connect connected with community resources. So this specifically was in regards to our neighbor to neighbor program. So our next steps in this were to take a look at what came back from our neighbor to neighbor and then to advance that work further. So we were in partnership with the AACSA. Uh, they gave us recommendations on what came out in our initial response of neighbor to neighbor. From that, we developed a scope and are going out for an RFP that is set to launch on April 19th with at least three lead agencies. Um, that program will be renamed SAFE, which will stand for um, supporting families equitably um, in community, uh, and we'll see what comes back from that. Specifically, we'll be looking at geographical areas that are most at risk, and we'll have a focus on our black, African-American, African ancestry, and Latino families in the community. So that's on recommendation number one. Recommendation number um, three on this really was regarding our um, research study and our partnership with Chapin Hall to take a look at fiscal implications for the department. I'm happy to report that the survey launched to staff for the staff piece in March. It will close in the end of April. We have also been in partnership with our fiscal department and Chapin Hall for the fiscal research. Um, that's being wrapped up. We will have an initial review of that by the end of April, uh, and we are on target to have that full report completed um, sometime this summer. So happy to report that that is on track. Uh, recommendations 20 and 23 really had to do with housing for our um, extremely low income youth. Um, you have the additional report in here from um, OSH and you'll have more information on this in item number 14 in which Damian Wright will be reporting on. And then the other recommendation was 24. Um, this was regarding our, again, partnership with OSH related to our community providers such as differential response and making sure they had training and access for families around housing. Um, happy to report that that training is being set up with all of our differential response providers as well as we will include our cultural broker providers as well. Um, it's being planned for end of May or early June, which will ensure all of our community-based providers have have access to and are trained in the housing resources with regards to OSH. Um, and then recommendation number 27 um, was the one that you are going to hear from Dr. Dewan on, really had to do with our um, partnership with County Office of Education and their partnership with all of our school districts in Santa Clara County, making sure that we are building out the data platform of Foster Vision and making sure that there is access to that data. Happy to report that the scope of work has been completed. County Office of Education has aligned funding and staffing for this project. Um, and so on track with an expected completion of 2024 on that. Um, and with that, I'll pause for any questions. Thank you. Any public comment on this item? Oh, I have one, yes. Uh, uh, Joanne Vars, and if there's any online. Good morning, Chairperson Chavez, County Supervisor and staff. On behalf of County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Mary Ann Dewan, and the Santa Clara Office of Education, we would like to register our support for the Joint Youth Foster, Joint Foster Youth Task Force recommendations. SCCOE is a key leader in guaranteeing that youth in foster care receive what is needed for the whole child. In particular, with Recommendation 27, SCCOE is focusing this work on AB 
740 notification in collaboration with legal advocates for children and youth, the county's public defender's office, and school districts, and through the build out of Foster Vision Plus, which will bring in data from the Foster Youth Educator Education Manager Program. Foster Vision currently supports youth in foster care and youth on probation by bringing together data from DFCS, JPD, and 32 public K TK-12 school districts in Santa Clara County while maintaining confidentiality. SCCOE continues to invest more than $750,000 annually into data warehousing, integrated data systems, data governance, and cybersecurity required to keep these resources safe and functioning. This project will provide invaluable support for hundreds of children and their families across our community. Thank you. Thank you for your partnership. With that, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, Sylvia, do you have comments or questions? Great, thank you. Um, just one thing that, um, a, a couple of issues that I wanted to raise, and the main one being that, um, and Deborah, this is something I would really like your thoughts on. I, I do feel like we've had enough changes in our system from when we first put the Foster Youth Task Force together to now to even the changes in law that I, I do want to figure out the best way to do an assessment of the well-being of children who are somewhere in our process, either through investigation or the outcomes of those investigations. And in part, um, we're making a big change in terms of trying to keep families together and better understanding um, the process we're using, how we're doing that, what the follow-up is on family well-being, what happens if they go to a differential response. I'm very, really excited, for example, about the pilot project. And, and honestly, we'd been looking at that pilot project as part of the Joint Foster Youth Task Force before any of these new um, policies were really in place. And so understanding the, the alignment of those and then, therefore, what does that mean for the well-being of children? I know that's very complicated. I know what I just said sounds simple and it's extremely complicated. So what I really wanted to ask is if you could give some thought to how you would approach presenting that information to this committee so that we would better understand the trajectory of, of um, how the county should be making long-term investments. As an example, one of the reasons that it was so important to create the Office of Children's Advocacy and really having that leadership position in the organization was that uh, both for Supervisor Ellenberg and myself, we were really thinking about how we are uh, moving resources to much younger components of, this, of our service model, you know, really serving, really how are we serving children are we getting deep enough into prevention both for them individually and with their families? And you know, presumably these law changes should give us the flexibility to move resources from one part of the system to another. I don't know if that's realistic or not. And, and, and if the Chapin Hall thing, I swear if that happens before I get struck by lightning, I can't even tell you how happy I would be. That has been one of the most frustrating <laughs> I mean, it's gotta be painful for you all because I've been annoying you about it too. Um, so I would just really like to see the results of that. But it does seem that that the timing for us to have kind of a deeper dive into this may be this summer really to say, what have, what have we learned and all of that? So I don't, uh, my, my request today is that during your verbal report at the next meeting, if you could give feedback about how we approach the Joint Foster Youth Task Force recommendations given the new state laws, given that we're gonna have that Chapin study, and and I won't make it more complicated than that, but, but, but with our partners, like the courts, our foster families, your staff, like how do we dive in and understand where we are today? Because it may actually mean, and um, Sarah, I'm gonna just pull you in for a moment, and actually Muriel as well, it may actually mean that the collaboration between our departments in terms of how we've been addressing this population needs to shift more fundamentally than it has yet. I don't know the answer to that. So I think, Supervisor, if I can, thank you so much for the question and, and, and the thoughts. Uh, one, we have an opportunity through AB 2083, which is a collaborative effort 
around the placement and also the prevention of young people coming into foster care and also even providing the whole continuum of care uh, for them. So I think that's one opportunity. The other piece is, yay, yay, finally the state has gotten their prevention plan approved. And so I think also those two are kind of like the pillars of looking at a whole continuum of care, which includes the partnership with other agencies such as behavioral health and probation, our partners, and, and others, our community-based nonprofit partners as well. So I think those are opportunities for, uh, that may be like lay the foundation for I think the information that you're requesting. That's a really, those are excellent points. Any, Sarah Morial? Thank you, Chair Chavez. Yes, I agree with what Deborah was saying and there are um, regular meetings on the prevention efforts that are coming down the line with the Family First Prevention Services Act um, that I think offer a lot of opportunity to collaborate and look um, into the future at how we evaluate the outcomes of the prevention efforts with regard to involvement in the foster care system. So those are exciting investments and I think we wanna keep an eye on what are the what are we funding and, and what are the results of that and design that into the work that we're doing. Um, thank you, Supervisor Chavez. I can confirm that the probation department is actively involved in all of the FFPSA planning processes and I'm working very closely with DFCS on this. So I think if a change in direction is needed or some sort of new approach, we are always at the table with DFCS and um, behavioral health and all of our partners. I think the one thing that I'm hoping that the Chapin Hall study, you know, part of the reason we requested it is we really were trying to model it after what we were doing to address homelessness, right? To really identify a system that's become, in my mind, very large for a, a group of young people and their families. It's relatively small compared to how we, we've been approaching it. And and by the way, not not by anybody's fault, but more just by design, right? And I, so I don't know if we can change that, but what I would just say, if you all could give some thought to the agenda and the framework and the key questions that you think need to be asked, and I'm not suggesting that we will have the answers to them, but I do feel like we're pretty far away from where we were in 218 now, both not just because of COVID, but because of these new changes. I think Sarah, you, you being here, I think, the role that probation, the really significant changes state statewide in probation, like the things are really different now. And I I don't want us to be using an old plan if what we need to be doing is a new, a, a new approach. So if you could just give a verbal at the next meeting, all of you, just your thoughts on that, then I would really like to understand, I think that would help Sylvia and I understand how this needs to be structured, and then if there are board actions that need to be taken that we can make recommendations to our colleagues about what we see sh should be on the horizon and what should be prioritized. And then on the Chapin Hall study, I'm gonna keep hope alive that I'm gonna see that. Okay, all right, good, all right. Um, I don't think, so we can take an action just to receive the report, and you wanna make a motion to that effect? Of course, so moved. And I'll second that with a report verbal report back at the next meeting if you all could think just a little bit about it. Great. Vice Chairperson Arenas? Yes. Chairperson Chavez? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move to item 11, um, and this is the school linked services report out, and I'm going to see if, um, if uh, Sylvia, if you have any questions or thoughts you want to start with here. Actually, I, I do want to thank, um, hi everyone. Thank you so much for, for the debrief on this um, uh, report and more importantly, all the really good work that you've been um, uh, laying down with our school districts um, to uh, integrate school link services. Um, into those systems. One of the things that I thought was just really exciting, and I just wanted to, I put a yay on it, was that they're, you're all adding triple P um, for level two and three for all parents to access, which I thought was just absolutely fabulous and fascinating. And you know, one, of the, one of the items that came up in our, in our conversations is my suggestion to, to um, 
make this really for, for the masses, if you will, and we talked about community centers and some non-traditional places where parents are already congregating, um, and there's a lot of you know parent institutes or parent universities in different school districts that could integrate some of these um, some of these wonderful triple P um, parenting um, presentations. Um, and so this, you know, I mentioned this uh, chair because I, I want to, one, I just want to um, make it clear to our, our public that there's just a lot of really good work that's being done on behalf of um, our children, our students, um, through our county efforts. Um, but not everybody buys in, right? And so one of the items that I actually asked um, the team about was that if there's folks, there's if there's some school districts, and this is where I think it really, for me as a parent, um, it really heightens my concerns about what school districts are kind of declining and saying, no thank you. You know, no thanks, we, we're good. We're good on, uh, with this. And, and exactly what is our role as policymakers and advocates for our, our respective communities um, to say to parents, listen, these are some of the services that can be offered through the school, but your school isn't, your district isn't accepting it. Now I know that that's not the most um, uh, reasonable and first, uh, <laughs> um, and first type of approach that we should take when we are having conversations that build, you know, good faith and, and harmony with our school districts. But as a parent, it makes me very upset um, because I know that there's the high end schools, and we talked about this, Catherine. We talked about how the higher end schools um, have a really great network um, or have access to resources, and then we have um, some of the schools that that are um, struggling and that uh, there's a lot of wraparound services um, because of that, because there's a lot of CBOs that are already targeting them. And then we have those schools that are in the middle. And those are our middle class students that are, maybe don't qualify for Medi-Cal um, exactly. And so there's not going to be a lot of CBOs who are gonna um, be running towards them because there isn't a reimbursement um, framework for them. And I know that there's an opportunity for school districts to tap into this reimbursement and have some technical assistance, yet they still may be declining. And so, you know, Tara, aside from, from recognizing the, the struggles that our, our staff are going through, I just, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how to approach um, this as policymakers and as advocates. Um, and maybe build, uh, be that bridge in between. And I know that you already have really great relationships with, with your school districts. I don't have any doubt, um, um, as I know that, that um, you've, you've been doing some really great, some really great work. In my, my district, I know you've been very patient with one of my school districts. I won't mention which one it is, but, <laughs> but I'm, really, I'm really happy there, there's some relatively some progress that's been made. And as, as a council member, I actually um, funded, uh, and I, I gave one of our school districts uh, about $100,000 so that they could do parenting workshops, and that has, still hasn't happened. And so I, I'd love to see how we can integrate some of the, the work that's being done through the city um, especially because there's a, a youth and child master plan that's being developed with the work that you, you've you all been leading and how do we build these efforts and then how do we utilize our respective offices to help um, continue to build up and out with what you've already been doing. So I'd love to, Catherine, I'd love to hear your thoughts, but I'd also love to hear um, chair your thoughts about potentially how to how to address something like this because I know it's it's prickly, it's very prickly. But I, I think as a parent, uh, you you would you know absolutely understand mm -hmm. how frustrating it is for for our schools to decline these these kinds of services in this point of our recovery. So yes, and I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to. Uh, 
to all of you and um, Sherry, it's good to see you. And just if, if you wanna give your perspective, because I, I do think what, um, what Supervisor Adenis is raising is so interesting because we've, you know, in terms of where you are in process. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Good morning, Chairperson Chavez and Vice Chairperson Arenas. I'm Catherine Spiris. I'm the Division Director of the Overseas School Based Services. And um, we have in, um, been trying to engage in outreach to school districts to ensure that they have. Um, access to services through our Mental Health Services Act, which would look like a SLS coordinator at East, each of the school districts. And we're expanding our prevention and early intervention program that would expand to all school districts as well as part of our FY24 um, planning. And although the school districts um, may be not engaged at the moment, we continue to outreach to them to address, to understand what the needs are and really promote the services. We have um, great partnerships with the school districts um, and uh, so existing schooling services school districts have offered to support with um, engaging with the other superintendents in hopes that they can share what that's being done in their school district and how they can leverage this county um, partnership. So we are still engaging and we our goal is to have an SLS coordinator at least in every school district and in FY24 to expand our, our prevention services, our universal strategies and supports to all school districts in the county. So just to follow up on, I, I think what more directly what, what um, Supervisor Arenas is asking is what, what strategies should we be thinking about to engage all of the school districts? Because what the, count, what the board said is, we're gonna make this available to every school district. I think the point you're raising mm -hmm. is that not all of them are being <coughs> responsive. So that, that's kind of one category. And, um, and then the, on the second category uh, is, I think that the, um, the type of responsiveness is really important. And so one thing that you did, I, I just wanna say, I think this is one of my favorite reports. I always feel like I learn a lot when I see it. One point I would just add is that as we're looking at each of the districts um, on, the, on the summary sheets, one recommendation I would make is that we're looking at total, total student population and total school engagement. Because where it says all, you know, when you're talking about Eastside Union High School District, you are talking about the, one of the largest high school districts, maybe in the country, certainly in the state. And so it would be important to be able to say, okay, they have this many referrals relative to this many school sites and this total student population. I, I more reference that because I, I think that what, um, what Sylvia's raising is really important. And I also would just say that it would be appropriate to have a summary sheet of every school district that's not engaged now and and if we've met with them, we met with them one last year and they opted out so that that record is actually kept. Because I think the point that mm. you're raising is that we're almost looking at it opposite. Um, but but just again, I would just do it as a sheet in the in the sheet part of this because it, because you'd be able to look at school, student population, number of schools, last contact was 2023 and they said no. So we have just, again, because this is so well done, I would just put it right at the end. Because I see that the, there's a district summary, well maybe I'm, let me just make sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that might actually work. And then the other thing is, is it would help us understand something like where you have a school district that has a really low set of referrals. Because then the other question I would ask is, how effective is the program you know, in those school districts. But you guys really do a fabulous, fabulous job. So I, I think if we could get that list. And then I also think there is value in us um, playing a leadership role in reaching mm -hmm. out to school districts too. And we have not done that out of respect for the process you're in and the role the County Office of Education plays. But in any board member's district, if there are schools that are not responding, I think the board, we should uh, ask our board colleagues to give them a call and give them a nudge or find out what's going on from their perspective. So that, that's one, one thought I have about just how do we do that. Is that sound okay with you? Yes, and actually I was just thinking about um, as electeds, we typically tend to talk to other electeds. 
about how we move our policy and um, and learn from from other jurisdictions as well. And so I do think that there there is a benefit for us to have a conversation with those other electeds to um, kind of sell this in a different way or um, or even the the investment with parent groups to share this is what your school district can offer if we have a group of, I don't know, 15 to 30 uh, mm -hmm. parents who are interested in, in the school and then we can um, gauge that uh, interest that way and lead it, um, have our, the elected in that school district engaged as well so that it, it's not coming from top down but really it's coming from the community i just would um yeah, i just great. worry about about the opportunity being missed by by our youth um is is the only reason i really i, I mentioned this and it just uh, it, like i said i it's it's not um because i don't think that that you all have a great relationship i know that the Obviously, you're absolutely um, highly professional and just a collaborator and a good partner. And um, and sometimes you, you need a bad cop, you know. <laughs> and I don't know if I make for such a terrible bad cop, but but I'm willing to to at least explore another option. And I don't know if it's a bad cop, but an alternate maybe an alternative it's just enforcement. Out. No, no, no. I actually no? think I think your point though about talking to the chairs of the school boards is really a good idea. We were able to we've had this concern as it relates to fentanyl training. Mm. You know, making mm -hmm. schools available and um, and I reached out to the schools that were that we we're not responding. Yeah, just to say we have this offering and better understand what their concerns were. I think we're meeting their concerns and we're going to get to do trainings in their schools. You know, so I think it really works. And sometimes it's just communication, different levels. It, 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 it could be. It, and yes, and um, certainly um, I think that investing in a campaign or some kind of outreach to our parents is probably something that um, I as a parent would would absolutely um, engage in um, anything that offers um, some alternative um, opportunities for me to learn as a parent and to um, support my my teenager um, and my eight-year-old uh, is is something that I, I'll I'll absolutely be responsive to so I think that there's an opportunity for us to do that as well and if it's a text you know, it could be a, a text campaign. It doesn't have to be somebody who comes on campus and, and engages. Or, um, I just think there's so many different opportunities for us to engage with parents. Um, and and those were, those were my those were my two comments. But I appreciate Excellent. that your feedback, Chair. Yeah, we can help with that. So you'll make sure we get some lists, okay? Yes, we will. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one last thing that I want to I I want to make sure that gets presented as part of the budget process, um, I am unclear about any consternation or concerns that we have about universal screenings. And I have, and in particular, I've been concerned about us not fully funding the Healthier Kids Foundation to do those screenings. So, I, and I, I didn't alert you today, so I don't need a response today, but as part of budget, I wanna understand how we're implementing those universal screenings how we're making sure the follow-up is happening, and what process are we using if we're not gonna use healthier kids, who, who are we using, and how are they gonna be as deep into the schools as this particular organization is, both cost-effective, but what I'm most concerned about is having really disciplined follow-up. Like the thing that, that has been most impressive to me is that we've been trying to get, you know, really support foster families and being able to follow up on issues for their children you know, dealing with low-income communities, this is the most detail, most effective outreach I've seen. And I know where, I know how many people are following up and I know how they're doing the follow-up. I haven't seen anything like this. And I am really nervous that if we're gonna make some change, that we have a method for doing it that's gonna make sure we do not leave a single family out and that we're using a strategy that really works with the families we're most trying to serve. So. 
again, bring as part of budget, if you guys could sure. just present on that as part of your overall uh, presentation, and I'm asking that through Greta. I know that we don't direct staff, but Greta, you do, and I can make it a motion. If, I'll just include that in the motion. Just, I want to make sure that gets reported out. And thank you again for the report, and really thank your team. I know we're doing our best to get deep, 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 and you have folks who want to help. So, with so that, for clarification, what, what is it that you're um, requesting about the universal screenings? Your, so the question. We, we have an investment that we've made through the Healthier Kids Foundation right. that's been year to year and not in our base budget, which I don't really understand why. And what I want the staff to explain is that if we're not going to be investing in healthier kids, mm -hmm. they may be, I don't, I, my understanding is that's not the case, then what is it that we're replacing it with? And how, do, how will it be as effective and expanded? Because these wellness checks that we began during um, COVID were just so effective and we found children at a much younger age, which meets all of the primary goals that our committees had, that the board has had. And when I have the last conversation I have with them, they reminded me that they're not in our base budget. I don't really understand why. So I just wanna make sure we have that discussion, not here, but as part of our budget discussion. And the nexus is to this report because so because these because our schooling services are connecting referring people to services they're making referrals to families for services and some of these referrals are coming from our these targeted schools that we're in already and so for me one of the things that I'm concerned about is schooling services to me is a very it's it's one method for kids to get services. In other communities, we're seeing the need that's relatively high for referrals. And what I'd like to do is make sure we're getting into those referrals at an even mm -hmm. younger age. So that's why it prompted me to ask the question here. I, I also would be interested in learning how screenings are, I, not necessarily, I don't know if, if there's any other outside uh, um, agency aside from healthier uh, kids who, who does this. Um, in terms of the universal screenings, um, but I, so I would like to, to I'll, I'll move, make that motion to not only receive the report, but to include that and to, to learn more about how universal screens are being utilized. Um, and the, the, and for me, it, it would be also be the follow-up. So I think it's important to have screenings, but <clears throat> for the most part, 80% of our, our children are faring okay, um, it's that 20% that we're always concerned about. Um, and for me, um, it, I, I worry that that 20%, we've identified them. Um, we, we put a red flag on, on them, um, but I don't know what that follow-up is and whose job that is to follow up with. And I know that Healthier That's Kids excellent. Foundation does, does some of that follow-up. I just want to know the efficacy of that. Um, I mean, is it working? Are, are those screenings then leading up to um, services being rendered and support being provided for that child? Um, that, to me, would be that bottom line. And, and I think that's a good point about the follow-up, but also if there are other providers that we're also using. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm dealing more with them because of the schools that I'm in, but there may be others, so that would be great. Sure. All right, so we have a motion and a second, and no, uh, oh, and one public speaker on this item. Sorry, John, I almost missed you. Thank you for being so patient. Are you looking for your notes? Yeah, one moment. I'm sorry. No problem. I just say that because I'm so old school. They're like this. I'm, I'm ready now. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Dear Chairperson Chavez, County Supervisors and Staff, on behalf of the County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Marianne Dewan, and the Santa Clara County Office of Education, we want to thank the county for its ongoing partnership in developing and expanding mental health supports for students on school campuses. Together, we are engaged in a complex and important work 
of ensuring that every child has access to the mental and behavioral supports that they need in a way that is accessible and effective for them. We are excited by the work and look forward to continuing and deepening our partnership. Together, we can ensure the robust expansion of our student wellness programs. While the county has deployed a variety of approaches to guaranteeing the health of the whole child, the evidence in the report compiled by the American Institutes of Research confirms again the dramatic effectiveness of school-based behavioral health programs, specifically through the wellness centers funded through MHSSA and SPHIP initiatives offered in partnership with and coordinated by the County Office of Education. Allowing students to access a variety of options and the choice of the ones that best meet their needs and preferences is the best way to ensure effective and efficient use of resources. We encourage the county to continue to use data from students and stakeholders in determining how to ensure the sustainability for these programs given the changing funding landscape. Decades worth of research demonstrates that children are 21 times more likely to get mental health treatment when based at schools. And that's why we encourage you to support continuing this trajectory. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, we have a motion and a second, and I'll ask if you could call our roll. Vice Chairperson Arenas? Yes. Chairperson Chavez? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Really good report. A lot of information. All right, we're moving on to item 12, and this is a report back on transgender, non-binary, gender expansive employee applicant and contractor recruitment retention efforts, including an update on SOGI data collection. And Sarah, do you want to just give us a high level real quick, and then we'll dive into questions? Do you have questions on this one? Good afternoon, Chairperson Chavez, Vice Chairperson Arenas, and committee. I'm Sarah Fernando, manager for the Santa Clara Office of LGBTQ Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to present on transgender, non-binary, and gender expansive workplace inclusion. As an overview, the goal of the initiative is to increase outreach and opportunities for trans and non-binary applicants, employees, and vendors, and strengthen retention rates at County of Santa Clara by creating an affirming workplace for everyone to thrive. In this report, you'll find the implementation plans from Employee Services Agency. You'll also find the status of administration's proposed gender inclusive policy, and SOGI data collection best practices, and through the Deputy County Executive for the Division of Equity and Social Justice, plans on which department will lead the county's SOGI data collection efforts. In December 2022, the Office of LGBTQ Affairs updated our action plan to support county workforce inclusion efforts. Since then, we have also included the consideration of SOGI to ensure all public spaces and resources in Santa Clara County are affirming, as well as to evaluate and measure trans and non-binary recruitment and retention efforts. Highlights within the report include the development of a trans and non-binary workplace inclusion train the trainer program for any county department or agency to participate in, partnership with Employee Services Agency Human Resources to develop and implement various recruitment and outreach strategies with plans for both organizations to table and present at a Northern California transgender job fair this April, host a virtual speaker series career event in summer and attend ongoing college and university career fairs early fall. The development of an implementation plan for an administrative guidance document related to gender inclusion at the county uh, with a review of the draft guidance uh, document is currently being completed by county council. And employee service agency is continuing to collect and report on SOGI data, as well as lead efforts to measure and evaluate trans and non-binary hiring, retention, and promotion trajectories with technical support and assistance from the Office of LGBTQ Affairs. We are open to any questions y'all have from the committee. Thank you. So, um, Sarah, I, I will just dive in here and say it's really amazing amount of work that you've accomplished. I really appreciate just your steady pace at making the changes this organization needs to make. I would like to make a motion that very simply requests that ESA and TSS work together to make sure that we can capture the SOGI data and PeopleSoft search for it and be able to use that data. 
And I would like this to be reported out to us by June. So moved. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Any comments or concerns or questions? Seeing none from my colleagues, I, and we have no public speakers, then we will um, take a vote. Vice Chairperson Arenas? Yes. Chairperson Chavez? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to the VASC. Um, and do you have questions on the VASC? No. Okay. So on the VASC, so first of all, let me just say thank you for staying and aging with us here while, I was, we, while we got to your item. Um, I know this is a bi-monthly report, and really what I want to start out is just saying thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, two, I want to share this with um, Greta and the other leaders on the dais that I, one of the things that I'm really excited about with the VASC is that I think we're learning how to provide services in a culturally competent way, but as importantly, integrating services that the county offers in one facility so people aren't going one place for behavioral health and one place for drug and alcohol, and one place, just that they can go to one location and that our teams are working together. Um, so what I want to make sure that I understand from your, from your venue is um, what if any learnings um, are coming out of the VASC, at, you know, um, and second, how we're hiring for leadership positions if in fact we have the opportunity, if this model is really working, to restructure our service provisions so they're more integrated across the county, what does that mean for the um, management of that facility in terms of their ability to get all the work done through different types of departments and so what I'd like to, to ask from you is for you to tell us when you can come back with an assessment of what, how you think the VASC is working. And that coupled with that, how do we build up leadership teams that have the authority? I'm not even worried about skill set because I think we have some amazingly skilled people, but the authority to give feedback to the different partners within those buildings um, instead of, well, for obvious reasons, just being able to manage from the top down. I mean, not top down, but integrated. Thank you, we'd be happy to come back both with an assessment of how we think things are going at the VASC and um, responses and thoughts on the question about how we um, create the appropriate leadership structure to really support integrated service delivery by multiple departments at a single location. Let me give some thought on the exact timeline to come back because obviously just the, the time period needed to um, uh, give robust thoughts, particularly on the first question, is one that I just need a little bit more information to be able to answer, but we can um, send an email to you with a proposed timeline to come back on that and get any feedback from you. That, on that would be timeline. great, and then the point A and then point B is, based on point A, what do we learned about the leadership and then what does that need to look like? Yep. Um, and then I just wanna say to both of you that um, I have gotten such glowing reviews and the new nonprofits that are in there are getting, people are talking to them like gangbusters. I've run into a couple of them and especially those d reaching deep into the community. Cancer Care Point is one that had been really trying to get into um, Vietnamese and Spanish speaking community at a deeper level and then also parents helping parents because we have a lot of disabled children um, the, whose family's primary language is Vietnamese or Spanish, and they're being able to get in there. They, I don't know how long they have been there, but they've already been really excited about the fact that they've met people they've never met before that didn't know these services were available for both of those nonprofits, so thank you. So that's all I have. If we wanna make a motion. Yes, I do wanna make a motion to <clears throat> receive the report. Um, I also wanted just to mention that I, I attended um, a Cesar Chavez uh, celebration event uh, for the local 521 this weekend. And the folkloric, uh, the Mexican folkloric uh, group that was presenting actually mentioned that they would be uh, now hosted at the VASC and so that they would be uh, having their, their daily uh, routines done um, at the VASC. So I thought just how comprehensive and how embracing it, it is of our community. Um, to integrate so many different folks. Um, as our chair already mentioned, uh, uh, Parents Helping Parents and, and Cancer Care Point. Um, I just thought this is, this is wonderful. We're just really bringing in all kinds of uh, folks into the VAS, so that was really lovely. So keep up the great work. 
And then with direction to staff to do that evaluation and the staffing. And yes, and so the motion includes to um, evaluate how VASC is doing as well as integrating that um, leader decision-making framework um, that was discussed. Thank you so much. So I'll make a second. We have no public speakers on the item. We'll take a vote. Vice Chairperson Arenas? Yes. Chairperson Chavez? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Or gentlemen. All right, we're going to move to item 14. And this is a report out on the hub. And, um, and I see the timeline in here. So, um, Consuelo, I know I should know the answer to this. This is fully funded already? Or are we waiting for tax credits? Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairperson Chavez. Consuelo Hernandez, Director of the Office of Supportive Housing. Uh, the developer has applied for tax credits, um, so they do not have their full funding yet. What's the whole gap? There's no gap. It's, uh, they're, they're simply waiting for their tax credit allocation. But, uh, so they were approved for the tax credit allocation? No, they're in process now. And how much of the, how, well, let me ask this, I'm not asking this clearly. When will they know the answer to that? We think, I'm looking at the, I'm, I'm looking at the rounds they can go through. So did they just, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm misreading this, did they just submit for tax credits? Uh, Good morning, Andrew Barnes, Office of Supportive Housing. Yes, they just submitted for tax credits in February. Got it. Okay. For some and for some reason, and I apologize, I thought this had been done a year ago. It had not, no. Okay. All right. So that makes more sense. And what do we think? And we'll, and so I'm looking that it says we will learn about when will we know the answer to whether or not we get them. The awards are announced on next month, May 10th. Okay. All right. And this, these tax credits um, are living in, uh, the decision is living in Fiona Ma's shop? Uh, tax credits, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and then, go ahead. Can I ask you a question sure. uh, on, based on that? So if... If uh, the developer doesn't receive the tax credit, what, what, is, what is the next step? What, do, what happens? Thank you, Vice Chair Adenas. If they are not successful in, in receiving their tax credits, we would position them to apply for the next round, um, which is pretty typical in most of our housing development sites because the tax credits are competitive at the state level. And uh, what, what would that, when would that be? It depends on the type of tax credit that we would um, submit them for. There's either a 4% or a 9%. Um, and we would assess the applications that were submitted in February um, to determine which of the routes is most um, competitive for the project. Um, so it could be later this um, spring or early summer. Okay, so the setback wouldn't be too dramatic. It, it wouldn't be, well, I it is, it is a setback. Anytime a project yeah. is not awarded a tax credit, mm -hmm. um, it typically delays the project from six to nine months. Oh. So it would be substantial. Oh, wow. Okay, well, I'm gonna cross both my fingers. So it it is, it is uh, consistent with the options we have presented to this committee in the past. Uh, we have always assumed that they would you know, that there is a possibility that they would not receive tax credits uh, during the first submission period. Well, th th I'm excited to, I can't wait to hear what the response is. I know that this is, this is a really great project. And so um, we'll, we'll just, uh, we'll just hopefully knock on wood and, and hopefully hear really positive feedback. Um, and I did move, right? I move it? No, go no. ahead. Oh, okay. So I'm going to make a motion to receive the report. 
And I'll second it. I, I do want to say just one thing about the tax credits, that one concern that I have is that six to nine months um, really could be a year or two. And we know that, at least from every study I've read, that one of the biggest cost increment cre increasers is people waiting for tax credits. So what I would be interested in understanding is what options do we have as a county? Um, and in particular, can we put money into the project and continue to apply for tax credits? Um, I don't know. I, I feel like I've done. I feel like we've done that before, and um, but I want us to consider that option because I am worried about increasing costs. And to be honest with you, the first time we met with young people about this project was in 2014. We're going to be at 10 years before they can move in today, and that's if everything goes right. And you know, some of them have graduated college, gotten married, had their own families. I mean, like. We got to get on this. So, is that possible to get money from another source and then still apply for tax credits? No, supervisor. The moment that we start construction with a different funding source, We're done. it would. It, uh, yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it, and I appreciate the report and the focus. All right. So we have a motion and a second. We have no public speakers, and we're going to try to do this before anybody has grandchildren. Cut. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know this is really hard, Consuelo. Thank you. Vice so, Chairperson Morinas? Yes. Chairperson Travis. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right. Ariel, we're going to you. If you have a, a verbal report. I do, thank you. Uh, the probation department would like to announce that um, we also participated in some March 30th, 30th Cesar Chavez events. Uh, we had um, probation staff, including the neighborhood safety unit and uh, juvenile probation uh, probation officers joined Somos Mayfair to support the Allen Rock Union School District in their annual um, Cesar Travis March from their school campuses to the Mexican Heritage Plaza. Um, and they also participated in, a, in the program, which included music history, dance, and culture. Six probation officers and two NSU staff accompanied students um, during the event to ensure their safety as they were walking along their routes. Um, and in March, the Prevention Early Intervention Unit um, participated with the San Jose Police Department um, to create an educational class to teach youth about the dangers of participation in street racing and sideshows. The class is for youth who have been issued citations um, and sideshows, which are an infraction. So uh, just a couple of quick uh, things that we've been working on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll hear from our social services agency director. Good afternoon. Just a couple of things to report. One, I alluded to earlier. Uh, the Families First Prevention Services uh, plan by the state has been approved, and so we look forward to having uh, plans coming from uh, DFCS uh, for your review uh, in the future. Uh, the plan is due July 1 uh, by the state unless they extend the time period because of the delay in getting the state's approval. Second, there are two county-sponsored bills, one on GA information sharing and the other on parent reunification. Uh, that are going through the legislative process. In fact, their initial hearings, committee hearings, are scheduled for today. Uh, Cal Saws, uh, we are going through Cal Saws. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how to say it any other than that. Uh, we're doing fairly well. We have a few little bumps and bruises to show for it. Uh, but this, that has not negatively impacted our clients getting their services. Uh, the last but not least, SSA was very successful in hosting a career fair on site, we had over 200 participants. We're evaluating to see actually how many we end up hiring. So it's the first time we've had a career fair on site and we're excited about that. That's it for SSA. That's exciting. And can you tell me the, the name of the bills, uh, the reunification and the info sharing? Supervisor, can I get that information to you? Absolutely. Via email, because I don't know that off the top of my head. Chair, we are on um, item number 17. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of points to make related to funding for child support. Before I do that, uh, Deborah mentioned CalSAS. I did want to thank her and her staff for working with DCSS 
on our uh, cow sales migration from Cowan as well were impacted. Uh, it's one of our key systems that we use in terms of working on our child support casework for all of our staff. So we appreciate all the great work her staff has done in helping support us through that as well. So thank you very much. Um, what I wanted to talk about briefly is related to child support funding. Um, obviously, DCSS has had many years of child support funding challenges, although recently there's a couple of opportunities that I wanted to mention that I think potentially may help with some of those funding challenges. Through our state association, the Child Support Directors Association, there are a couple of key work groups that um, I think are really monumental in terms of changing the way some of that funding has worked. Uh, one is there's a mid-year reallocation work group where instead of having state DCSS um, provide and manage the mid-year reallocation funding, so if there's any additional funding left by any counties that aren't using it, there's a process at the state that would allow counties to put in for that and be able to access some of the funding that goes unused statewide. That's now great. we're in the process of working with the state to have that process be moved over to our state association and have CSDA uh, manage that process similar to what the uh, CWDA, the Child Welfare Directors Association does on an annual basis. So I mentioned that because there's a potential to give us more control around reallocation of unused funding on an annual basis. So there's an opportunity there uh, to maximize that. Uh, the second point is there's also a work group related to the redistribution of funding. I'm on both of these uh, to look at the existing funding model and see if there's any opportunities to redistribute it to make it more equitable. Uh, Santa Clara County is one of those um, county child support agencies, the largest actually, that has not received any additional funding through that methodology. Wow. So these two work groups that I'm on give us a potential opportunity to address those ongoing funding challenges. So as uh, we progress, uh, with those work groups, I'll report back to the committee, but I did want to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Go get the money. <laughs> no pressure. All right. Um, I think that that is all. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah. Oh, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I'll start with a couple legislative updates. Um, our office is monitoring bills that have been introduced in Sacramento that are aligned. Um, with efforts of our office, and we're we are in support of two bills, uh, one AB 2030, expanding access to free menstrual products in public schools, serving students, um, expanded to serve students in grades three through 12, and uh, SB 242, supporting the California Hope Opportunity Perseverance and Empowerment for Children Trust Account Program, ensuring funds that are in the Hope accounts are not considered as income uh, or assets when determining eligibility um, and benefits for youth seeking CalWORKs, CalFresh, and Medi-Cal services. So we're working closely with um, IGR to monitor these bills as they advance through the legislative process. I also want to give a quick update on the Youth Task Force. The spring is turning out to be a really busy season for the task force because it's the member recruitment period. So over the past month, our staff has been meeting with board offices and we have an updated application for the Youth Task Force membership. Um, we've developed application evaluation criteria and outreach strategies to encourage new and interested young people to apply to fill the vacant seats. So we have a total of seven vacancies um, and at least one vacant seat in each of the board offices. So uh, we have the um, application available and live now on the Boards and Commission's website. It closes April 30th. We're doing outreach at um, several elementary and middle schools throughout the counties. And uh, our office will work with members of the board offices as well as um, several members of the Youth Task Force to evaluate uh, applications and, and get a new group of young people serving. And then lastly, uh, in May, I'll return with the first of quarterly reports um, and updates on the child care infrastructure grants and investments in early education workforce. But I wanted to let you all know that we are starting to work with cities um, to prepare for the grant process. And tomorrow we'll be at the Santa Clara County City Managers Association meeting. Um, and we will be distributing a survey to start to collect information from cities uh, on representatives that can support identifying city level um, partnerships that will allow us to work on the grants uh, process. So we'll be getting contact information for city departments and partners in areas 
to support outreach efforts to prospective small businesses that may be interested in the grants, um, in-kind supports to grant applica applicants through uh, city departments like libraries that can help with some in-kind services, partnerships and networking with other local partners involved in childcare expansion, and finally, helping childcare providers with processes such as understanding construction and city permit requirements. So working um, to identify uh, the finance planning and building inspection contacts at each city so we can put together all of those resources. So really starting to ramp up that partnership. Um, and that concludes our office's report. Thank you. That's great work. Good. Well, thank all of you very, very much. And please um, thank your staffs for the really excellent work that we're seeing. And I look forward to seeing you um, at our next meeting. We are adjourned April 27th. Mm -hmm.